You're listening to Pop, the History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. John Aetherwood, welcome. I mean, it doesn't seem more than a week or so since we last talked. And um, I got a great reaction to, uh, you, you know, our talk about uh, decades, joy division and new order. So thank you for that. Today, we're on a different subject. Another book of yours, um, Radiohead, Life in a Glass House. Um, when this first came in, what research did you do and what did you find out about what is out there, the writings on Radiohead, so to speak? Well, Radiohead are really an extensively covered band. They've been written about for, for decades, but no one I think has ever quite caught to grips with them because they're very, very elusive. They are uh, an almost locked down mothership. So you kind of get little bits of granules from each piece, from each review, from each news section that they write. There are obsessive websites, some very, very good. And I don't think anybody had really synthesized everything that has been written and spoken about Radiohead and under underlaid that with the music, which for the most part is absolutely remarkable, but they are, they're so self-contained. They are a, a, a mothership in permanent lockdown, particularly when they started selling records. When, as soon as they began to sell records, as soon as they began to become popular, then they could shut down because there are many, many different periods to, to Radiohead. But one of them, which I think is what you kind of alluded to, is that for the, the first, certainly the first album, perhaps the second one too, that as part of a, a, the major label, they had to step into the machine. And this meant for them doing things that were absolutely, as we now know, out of character. Things like the MTV beach parties, where they, they would play surrounded by scantily clad, bikini clad women and men who were more good looking than any member of radio could ever hope to be. And they would play their music surrounded by these people in, in what is frankly a frat party setting. They had to do these type of things. So as soon as they had power, the first thing they did with that after the learning that they could control their musical destiny was to control how they presented themselves and what they said. And the short answer to that would be, they wouldn't say very much and they wouldn't present themselves very often. And this for a biographer is both a delight and a challenge too. Yeah, I mean, what you've done is you've got this chronological telling of their story, but within that, there are sort of other threads. And one of the big threads, I see it as a thread really, is, is your humor <laughs> around that, you know, there's nothing sort of majorly wild, extreme or extraordinary uh, in a way about them. And, and by using this humour, it really comes across, you know, this side of them that you have just explained about them not being in the lim limelight, not being sort of public figures in any way. Um, and, and that makes this, uh, this book very, very entertaining, funny, and also, of course, extremely informative. Well, I mean, there is, there is an absolute absurdity to anyone who becomes incredibly famous through making music. It's a, a bizarre position to be in. And Radiohead, to an extent, do play with that a bit, but to, to suggest that they're, they're, they're humorless and precious, just simply isn't true, but there's, there's something incredibly absurd about Radiohead, about the people involved. It's, you could almost say it's happened by accident, except it hasn't. It's been a constant state of evolution. And there is something, there is something funny about them. They don't make funny music. It doesn't mean that they take themselves or their art less seriously. And it doesn't mean that I did too. But I think that that sense of absurdity, which they all seem to feel, that this strange, peculiar, warped, but wonderful music has made them 
incredibly popular and giving them the freedom to channel their own destiny, it's an absurd situation. I mean, it's almost, and it sort of made them extremely compact and together uh, as a band. What is unusual about them as a band, as opposed to as individual members? I think that it's an old cliche, but it works here in that the collective is stronger than the individuals. That you can say to, to people such as Colin, the bassist, and, and Ed, the, the other guitarist who isn't Johnny, you say to them, why is it precisely that you do? And it's and to, to answer that question is very, very difficult. And I think it's it certainly caused Ed a, a certain amount of, of angst over the years. But Radiohead would not be Radiohead without Ed, just as they wouldn't be Radiohead, of course, without Tom and Johnny. It's, it's, it's a, 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 such a compact organization that each member, each of the five members, brings different things to the whole of Radiohead. And I think this means that they can say long like no other, that there isn't, there's never been great dissension. They've had long, long periods of not producing any music. Their recording sessions tend to be quite fraught, but nothing absolutely nothing that has ever come out that a member has seriously felt like leaving. Tom, in his more drama queen moments, has a sort of implied that it's all a bit much for him. But even in Tom's case, the things that have ground him down, such as travelling, such as touring, such as the machine, when he's gone off on his, his solo projects and his sidelines, such as The Smile, the first thing he's done is gone on the road and taken his music out. Tom is He's a road warrior, just as much as any member of, of Def Leppard or Iron Maiden. And therefore, that they, they're, they're, it's a band who seem to be, in a way, under no pressure. Phil Selway, the drummer, he said, the only reason for us to get back together now is because we want to. And that's an extraordinarily privileged position to be in. But you haven't got one person, I think, trying to force the others. They are, they're, they're, they're not entirely a musical democracy, but outside of the music, they are. They seem to be an absolute democracy. And you haven't heard bitchings. You haven't heard of frayed relationships. And of course, this doesn't mean that there hasn't been arguments that have been ludicrous to suggest. It doesn't mean that everybody likes each other equally, to put it crudely. You know, you've got five grown men. They are not all going to be uh, friends of, of equal value and equal standing. but everyone does seem committed to the mothership. And that's the glorious thing about it. If you do it properly, when you sell a lot of records, when you can play stadiums, then you have that freedom to do what you want, when you want. And that's an amazing thing. So what are their individual contributions then to the band? If the band is the bigger thing, the whole, then what do the individual members contribute? Well, uh, I think you have to separate what they contribute to the overall picture and to what they contribute musically. I mean, Tom is clearly the, the, the musical lead. I don't think anyone would really dispute that. He has the, the overriding vision, but it's not, it's not as, as other bands. You, know, you can pick your own band here. You obviously have a, a, an ordained leader and there is no sense of, of democracy. Tom is just sort of the guide, the musical guide the one who pushes them. And he will take them in alternative directions that some of the others wouldn't necessarily do. But we'll come back to that in a second because that doesn't necessarily mean there is conflict. And Tom is also the, the, the sort of spirit of Radiohead in a way, partially because he's the front man and partially because he is the one who writes the words, to put it in very simple language. That means that what the, the, the lyrics, the words that you hear, are mostly his, all of us do, do chip in. And Johnny, the Johnny Greenwood, the guitarist, is of course one of the great guitarists of our generation on a technical level. But he is also thrusting musically on a slightly different direction to, to Tom. He's not as interested in beat and vibration as Tom is. What he is interested in is different types of music, that he will experiment, experiment with classical music, with Indian music, and this sounds 
on the surface, how I'm trying to describe it to you, as though he is a bit of a dilettante, but he's not. He's not. He's a quester. And this also means that Radiohead will sound different to not just to other bands, but to themselves, that they will evolve. And Ed, who is a second guitarist, but that's not fair. He's not a second guitarist. He's another guitarist. He fills in the gaps that Johnny deliberately leaves. And no, uh, no one would suggest for a moment that he, he's technically gifted, but one, he's really good. And he adds things. He is the, the one who is, is, I think, is more troubled by Radiohead's success than any of them. And in that sense, that means that he is an anchor. And I think he's done his, he did his solo album. He lived in Brazil for a while. And that partially suggests a man who, who is, is struggling a little bit, but I don't think he is. I think he, he knows that he can come back to Radiohead whenever he wants. And Colin Greenwood, obviously Johnny's brother, the bassist, very much a typical bassist. But, he, but you listen to, listen to the bass lines on the first two Radiohead albums. Yeah, they're very good. Of course, they're very good. They're also very, very conventional. From then, from, from OK Computer, then Colin becomes, without losing what a bassist is, he becomes this bass innovator. And you can't carry a band forward like Tom and Johnny are doing without having a suitable anchor, a musical anchor, and a bassist who will change and will adapt. Yeah, you know, listen to stuff that he's doing on, on King of Limbs. He's like, Crikey, is that the same guy? Sort of is, sort of isn't. Doesn't matter. He's grown. And he's also someone who, who keeps Radiohead in touch with the real world in a different way. They go on tour. Tom will explore art galleries and, and museums. Johnny will, of course, be found making music. Somehow, Colin, Colin will be with the road crew. He'll be having drinks with the road crew. And that too is important because, it, again, I keep using this word anchor, but it anchors Radiohead in a completely different way. And then you have Phil Selway, the drummer, and he might have been, he might have been the person who'd musically suffered when Radiohead in, embraced beats and things away from being a bog standard indie band. And you know, the Bands is a great record, it's a, but it's still identifiably an indie record for a band who were on a major label, of course. And Phil was the person who might have suffered more than anybody. They didn't want, Johnny and, Johnny and Tom, didn't want conventional drums on these albums. You'd imagine any other drummer might have been a little bit sulky about this, that find themselves slightly emasculated by it. Not Phil. He learns to play in a completely different way, which also shows the sort of person that he is. He is a man who will adapt. And he's also, he has a different private life to the other. Phil is a, is a, a member of the Samaritans. Who, for all our, our, our non-British viewers, the Samaritans are an organisation who suicidal people call. People who are having extreme mental health difficulties call, and there is an anonymous stranger on the line, and they're working for the most part for, for no money at all, it's a charity, but because they're dealing with such sensitive and difficult issues, of course they have to be properly trained. It's not as if you, you and I could pick up the phone and do this, so it's, it takes considerable commitment, and it's also completely anonymous. Clearly, you don't want to radio head fans to be calling this. You know, hello, I'm Phil Selway. I'm a drummer in a band you may have heard of. It's not, it's completely anonymous. That's how it works. And that I think is, is a good example of the type of person that Phil is. He was the only person in the early days who had a, a proper job. He wasn't, he wasn't faffing about, he, was, he was, was working in an office. And you'd imagine if Radiohead hadn't taken off, Phil Selway would still be working in, in an office. And as it's not for a second, to sound derogatory. He's the sort of person you need in a band. He's obviously a good, good man. And if you bring all these disparate elements together, then you have this strange collective that is Radiohead. So what actually, you know, you, you talk about their disparate elements. Um, they weren't friends. 
when they were at school, yet they were pulled together. What actually pulled them together then? Well, uh, they, they went to the same school, so location pulled pull them together as much as anything. Unless we remember all these decades later, this band of school, we'll call them friends for the sake of argument, this band of, of school acquaintances are still together. The, the lineup hasn't, hasn't changed. And of course you had two brothers in there, so you've got a very uh, a different kind of relationship with the Greenwoods. But initially when they started, before they became on a Friday, then I think it's, you know, the teenage boys, they wanted something to do, playing in a band. You're probably more likely to meet girls if you play in a band, particularly if you're going to, to a fairly posh private school, which meant, of course, that all their backgrounds were very, very solidly middle class. You're not talking about people who've risen from the ghettos here. And what brings what brings bands together? They were those early stages, those early rehearsals. They, they were sort of part art project, even then, lest we forget, but also part very much an ordinary indie band. But I think the interesting thing in those early days is that when they went off to university, which of course is them to separate universities, um, that's the moment where school bands give up. Of course they do, because but people getting educated, they go and live somewhere else, they do properly discover girls, and they've got a, a degree from a reasonable university, and that sets them up for life. This, I think, was the, the first indication that, that Radiohead were absolutely different to other people, because apart from Johnny, who, who dropped out because he was younger than the others for no other reason, then they all completed their education and in every, every vacation that they had, they came back to Oxford. It was just a sense that they were waiting to get their degrees before they came back and were really serious about it. And this, this is incredibly unusual. I think it's unique that they could defer gratification like that. And it shows incredible mental strength. You know, even at this point, they all believed, not necessarily that they'd be huge, but this was worth waiting three, four years for. That's amazing, at that young age. When people come out of university, they don't do that sort of thing. They don't all come back to join, to rejoin and rekindle the band that they've been in three years ago. It's incredible. But it also suggests an out clause in a way. It's like your parents saying to you, well, before you do this, make sure you go to university and get your degree because you might want to fall back on it. Yes, that's absolutely. And then, you know, Johnny's parents were, were incredibly distraught when, when he dropped out, but they couldn't wait all those extra years for you and Johnny to, to do it. I, there is, of course, there's, there's, there's insurance, but I think also from the parents' point of view, uh, that you know, you've got your kid going to university, he says, right, I'm going to, or she says, right, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be in the band, whatever happens. As a parent, do you think, Three years later, yeah, right. Of course not. He'll be he'll be off in the city making making millions. You know, he'll be he'll be or, or he'll be doing charity work in 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 the Congo. You don't think you don't seriously believe as a parent? Yeah, of course he's going to come. He's going to come back to where he's brought up. He's going to rejoin that band after the education that we've strived for. You wouldn't possibly think that as a parent. <laughs> so therefore, I think it was it was. It, it was certainly a major surprise to some of their parents how it happened that they all came back to Oxford and that they were, they all, it was almost as if they hadn't got their degrees. They're just straight back in there. I mean, you mentioned the original name, the original sort of first real name of the band on a Friday. I mean, you can't imagine today uh, the music of Radiohead being made by a band called <laughs> On a Friday, can you? It's like somehow. <laughs> It doesn't fit together. <laughs> it, it doesn't. It doesn't fit at all. But the, but you know some of that the, the the on the on a Friday music has dribbled out, and yeah, the, it, on a Friday's music sounds like a band called on a Friday. But, you know they knew it was rubbish even then, and they were a very average band. So you know they needed they needed a, a, a they needed a name change before, long before they had the the musical sea changes that they they began with. 
in in your younger years, if you had been offered a six album deal <laughs> with a shitload of money, what would you have gone, gone out and spend it on? And what did they spend it on? <laughs> well, I mean, not, not myself, I'd probably spent it on heroin and prostitutes. <laughs> but I, I, I think, um, but th this was this was not this was not the way that, that the line that Radiohead took. I mean, they were given a massive deal, but massive deals are never ever what they seem. There are break clauses after you can sign a twenty album deal. Who cares? Because the radio, the, the record company can certainly in those days drop you after one up without being in breach of contract. There's always the clause there. And then and an advance isn't free money to spend on heroin and prostitutes. It's money that you, if you start to sell records, you're going, you will have to pay back and you will be in debt to your record label for a long time, as many vastly successful bands have discovered. Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter if you if two years later you're, you're asking, would you like fries with your pizza at the drive-in? That, then that's fine. You won't have to pay that money back. <laughs> Curiously, the more records you sell, the more in debt you become. And I think Radiohead, they've never seemed, it's, it's, it's easy to say this now, they're all multi-millionaires, but in those, in, certainly in those early days, the fact that they were handed checks by a major record label before they'd sold a single record, it didn't really turn their heads. They've always been fairly business savvy, but I don't think they were that bothered. I think they were always looking for the freedom to make music that they wanted. And that's where all the early compromises came from because they knew that they would have to play the game. They never wanted to sign to an indie label. They wanted to get into the, the heart of the machine as soon as they could. And I think certainly in those days, although it was a bit untrendy, it was a bit unsexy, the best way to do it was through a major label, if you possibly could, and if it was a major label who vaguely, never completely, because major labels aren't like that, but a, a major label who vaguely understood them. And they had people such as Keith Rosenkopf who did understand them and who did fight for their corner when it was looking as if they were going to be one hit wonders. Yeah, talking about one hit wonders, I mean, the first um, release of Creep um, wasn't a hit. And I suppose there's a suggestion of loyalty here as well on, on, in the further story. But, um, you know, the Israeli forces DJ that played that and sort of instigated uh, the change and then taken up by um, other countries was a very important step for them. When I talk about uh, loyalty, they, they've had a connection to Israel because of, because of that. Um, and yet later on, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the ugly side of Roger Waters comes up <laughs> and, you know, like complains about them going and performing in Israel. And this is, this is a, a point where they did react, isn't it? I think, that, I think their relationship with Israel tells you absolutely everything you need to know about Radiohead as a unit. As you've just said, that the first radio station in the world to, to heavily feature Creep was, of all things, Israeli forces radio. And uh, oh, as you might imagine, Israeli forces radio is quite a big thing in Israel. And this meant that the, the, the song became a hit. They went over to Israel in the very, very early days and they played uh, concerts, which gave some indication of what it might be like to be successful. But one of the, the, the most important thing that, uh, that, that's happened in their early dealings with Israel is that uh, Johnny married an Israeli woman. And she, uh, she became obviously part of the, the, the Radiohead in a circle, that family group, which has never ever been breached. No one has spoken out of turn on this. She was, she now by falling in love and having and getting married and having children with, uh, with Johnny, she became part of the, the Radiohead in a circle. Fast forward, as you said, many, many years later and they're a globe straddling band. And what they always tried to do as much as they could was to play gigs in Israel. And yeah, obviously there are certain issues with this, but the last time 
then Roger Waters and Ken Loach, the filmmaker, got involved and very, very publicly said that because of the Israeli treatment of the Palestinians in what may or may not be their territory, depending on, on which view you take on this, was unacceptable and that they should like Ken Loach, although obviously quite a lot of countries boycott Ken Loach's films anyway, and Roger Waters, that they should not play Israel. And this is where this is where the dynamics of Radiohead come in, because you'd imagine, and, and, and I, I have no evidence for this, of course, but it would you would imagine that Tom York might be quite unsympathetic to the state of Israel and very very sympathetic to the plight of the, the Palestinian people, and you'd also imagine that perhaps he might have felt slightly uncomfortable with this, but no. No, for one of the very, very rare times in Radiohead history, they completely doubled down on this. And Tom, not Johnny, this is the important thing, I think. Tom made a statement effectively telling Roger Waters and Ken Loach where to go and saying we will absolutely 100% play Israel. He didn't mention Johnny. He didn't mention Johnny's wife. He didn't mention their history with Israel. This was the absolute doubling down. And Tom is not one, as we know, to, to write open letters to people. He's not one to publicly defend himself on these type of matters. But when the, the, when the mothership is attacked, Tom responded, and he put that absolutely unequivocally before anything else. Some of his audience might have been displeased. And, you know, they had, a, they had a Palestinian supporter. Clearly, Radiohead are not pro the worst aspects of the Israeli state. Of course they're not. But the collective is more important. He would not, for a second, alienate Johnny or Johnny's wife by saying something out of turn from what, the, what Radiohead as a collective do and believe. And that shows, I think, that everything comes, that, sorry, I think that shows that the collective comes before everything, where Radiohead are concerned. You say when the mothership is attacked, the collective is then one. It's a, it's a unit. And then if you compare that to Roger Walters and his, you know, yeah. previous existence uh, in Pink Floyd, where they only communicated through lawyers <laughs> at yes. one point, you know, and it's quite weird because in a way, um, I think my personal feeling is musically, there is some connection, but in terms of the band and how it is, it's completely different. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. And of course, of course, Roger, Roger Waters' as way uh, is as part of a band was, was friction and internal dissension. Uh, and fighting for power within a band. That's never been the case with Radiohead. But musically, as I, I, I think you were suggesting, Steve, musically, the, 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 the comparisons are absolutely valid. This was both bands in very, very different eras, making weird, angular, non-commercial music that just happened to sell millions and millions of copies across the globe, and that they were both musically uncompromising for both you didn't know where they were really going to go from one album to the next but the the significant difference is is that there's never seemed to be any battle for the leadership of Radiohead there hasn't been people pulling in, in musically different ways you know you didn't have songs say on a lot of Pink Floyd albums where David Gilmore contributed separately to Roger Waters and you didn't have the wall and the final cut, which were essentially, and it's a crude interpretation slightly, but they were essentially Roger Waters' solo albums. No Radiohead album has come close to being a Tom York solo album. You know, we've got Tom York solo albums anyway. We know what they sound like. But uh, it's, it's simply not the case that they, they have pushed themselves forward through internal division. And... So you have, you have Pink Floyd, who I think the best musical example 
and the best musical forebears of Radiohead, but they conducted themselves in such different ways. Now, you mentioned earlier the uh, MTV Beach House, and this is where um, they were in, you know, inverted commas, forced to play Creep, I think it was four times, <laughs> one after the other, because it was being being filmed and it was sort of a it was a moment for the for the band because then came an impromptu performance of anyone can play guitar um and this does seem to be a pivotal moment in their existence and maybe their thinking is that true or is am i just reading too much into <laughs> that i think it was a significant moment but but that that MTV fiasco, which, as you correctly said, they subverted at the end, much to the horror of, of MTV, who just wanted the hit, of course they did. But that was, I think, the culmination of their, their early dealings with their American label, who were not particularly keen on signing Radiohead at first. They, they went over there, they virtually cold shouldered. And then suddenly, suddenly, of course, Creek turns out to be this massive hit. And the next time they turn up at the American record label, People are, are they're, they're, the staff, the staff are wearing T-shirts that say creep on them and they're greeted like conquering heroes. And, you know, two of the people, this might have, have gone to the head and they might have made that thing that suddenly the American uh, label are with us. They want us. No, no, the, label, the, the creep, creep had become a hit, irrespective of the American label. And yes, they were, they, they did have to do these MTV things. And you're right to put forced in inverted commas. They could possibly have said no, but had they said no, then the American company who, who decided, understandably it must be said, that Radiohead were a one hit wonder, would have, would, would have instantly, instantly lost interest. And I think that was a, a, an understanding of, for Radiohead, that look, we do have to play the game in the early stages. Of course we do, because they will just ignore us like they did at first. But as soon as we're fortunate enough to get any kind of position of power, which for Radiohead didn't come until their third album, the Americans really didn't take to the bends at all, then we can do things our way because the record company, one, will always be there, and two, they, are, they, they, blow, they blow like the wind. You know, they're, they're very malleable. They're looking for the next big thing. But there, be, there comes that point where you are established within a record company, and you then almost become more important than the label. And that's what happened to Radiohead, and that's what gave them the freedom. I mean, you mentioned an interesting thing about American companies and MTV being an American company and me having worked for it, that I know full well how they would use something that they didn't particularly like at that moment, which uh, would, you know, for the best example, is Money for Nothing from Dire Straits, you know, a song that is very anti-MTV, and then turn it around into the MTV song. So I think in that sense, Americans are very savvy at taking something and turn it into their favour, where they may have been rather upset at that moment that it happened. But in terms of Tom York, when um, Creep initially was an success, and you've got this quote in the book. He says, in 10 years, people will be playing Creep and saying it's a fucking classic record. We know that. He hadn't read his own memo <laughs> himself, had he? I mean, it is fantastic. <laughs> he's got, you know, he says that. And, and, then, and then they find their freedom, you know, and then they find what they want to do. Okay, it's over the space of a couple of albums and, and you know, and then by... Uh, OK Computer, it's there. But it's a very interesting process that I don't know of any other band who has so consciously and massively changed and kept their success. Well, it's... I think... I, th I, 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 can, see what you're, I can see what you're saying. But there was... But it, those, those first three albums, you have the first one, Pablo Honey, which... which you know, frankly, let's let's be honest about this, isn't great at all. It's incredibly generic. There are moments of inspiration, but there are moments of bog standard indie inspiration. And there was nothing there to, to suggest that this was a band who were in it for the long haul. And you had Creep, and Creep, 
for all what Tom York was saying at the time, which, which even when I was pulling that quote out, it seemed very much as he was chiding everyone for not making it the obvious hit that it should have been. I mean, creep, it's, you know, without sounding like Radiohead Taliban, it's just not great. It's not great. It sounds like a one-hit wonder. It's sort of teenage dirtbag for the for the era. And the Benz is much, much deeper as an album. It's much better, and it's still recognizably indie. And Radiohead couldn't have been dropped after Creep was a big hit, but it's it still had the air of the second album of a band who are about to get dropped, which is much better than the first album. But it doesn't matter anyway because they're not getting hits. So you have a third album, and expectations are incredibly low. And you know, the initial print run was very, very low. And the Americans, bless them, didn't understand this strange work that they were presented with. And again, you can always see the Americans point. You know, one, it's not creep, but two, it's not an indie band. It's not the verb pipe, is it? You know, it's something completely out there for them. And you have this, it's, it's almost a band who had nothing to lose. It wasn't the act of desperate men. I think they firmly understood that they had made a great record. They had the, the axe hanging over them. And it was, let's just do what we want to do. Let's change things. Let's separate ourselves from the pack. Let's do something that might just work. And there was complete belief in this. You know, they... they and things happen by accident. Scott Litt, the, the REM producer, he almost got involved with, with Radiohead. And then they would have sounded very, very different, I suspect. Now, instead, they had Nigel Godrich, who had never produced an album on his own before Radiohead. But he understood their vision. So there was, there was, there was arguments in the studio. There was, there was uh, difficulties about which way that they were actually going to go. There were frustrations when the songs weren't working. But what never wavered was their belief in this new direction. And they had someone supportive in the studio with them who would also, would also stop some of their nonsense. And when I say some of their nonsense, I really mean sort of Tom's nonsense. Um, <laughs> and that's sort of how it happened. And it's not, it's a difficult thing because on one hand, it is a great accident. But on the other, it's not. It's, it's carefully thought through without worrying how we're going to follow up Creep, that song which was a hit two albums ago. And part of the contribution to that must have been like the, the record company not understanding them, the radio stations not willing to play uh, stuff that they stood behind, let's say, put it that way. So maybe that, you know, these... Uh, it's it's there's sort of two decisions going on in a sense isn't it being pushed in one direction and then making that decision from what they want to do or am I completely wrong I I I, I, I don't I don't think so I mean the right. Benz lest we forget got good reviews in Britain and Europe it's just the Americans who didn't take to it and there were signs on, say, the ben, the song, the Benz itself. You know, there were signs that this is, it's, it's still an indie album, but that's a freak track on an indie album. And that was probably the pointer to what was going to happen next. And there were still people who supported them at the British label. They had sold some records in continental Europe through the Benz. And it wasn't, it wasn't a disaster. It wasn't a flop. It just wasn't a very big hit in Britain. And it gave them a little bit of traction. But what Parlophone very smartly decided to do is perhaps because they weren't so bothered about radio, because they weren't a priority, is that they didn't bother them with deadlines too much. So Radiohead had the opportunity to spend time in the studio. And they were, particularly at that stage, a band who needed a lot of time in the studio. So it was almost like a perfect storm. Um, and then if you go down that line too much, you end up saying, well, OK, computer was a fluke and they were lucky. And that isn't the case. 
but as, as you divine, there are two different strands here. One is circumstances, and the other is the actual music that they were making. And every band who's successful needs look at some point. And I think that was the point where everything went right for Radiohead. For once, the lights began to turn green for them. What band would you say is the closest to how Radiohead are? I've got one in my head, and I just wondered if you're going to come up with the same. <laughs> have you really? Um, <laughs> well, you, I mean, you have, as I said before, you have, you have Pink Floyd uh, who are a precedent in terms of how they conducted themselves. But I, I think, I, I, very interested to see who you see, but I struggle with this notion quite a lot because I don't think there are anyone who, who's sold that amount of records and played that level of venues with that level of public profile. Because when Pink Floyd were doing it in the, the, the 70s, it was easy. No one, obviously no one knew what any member of Pink Floyd looked like, but there wasn't social media. The fanatics had no way of, of getting to their band. They, were, they, they weren't in magazines, which was important then. There was no television, hardly, for popular music. So maintaining that aura of mystique was much more straightforward. Now it's not. You know, Radiohead have their, their own website. When their, their, their stuff gets stolen, they can put something out on Twitter and they can release it themselves. People have got a pretty good idea of what Tom York looks like. Although I strongly suspect that any member of Radiohead can walk down any high street and not be recognised at all, which in today, after all these years of being so popular, is absolutely incredible. So to do, to do that, I'm not sure, I'm not sure there is another band. I'd love to know who you think. Uh, well, I suppose it's musically and also through their legacy. But when you mention it in terms of being, you know, of, of being such a massive selling uh, band, then that doesn't fit. But someone like, you know, a band like Can, for me, uh -huh. um, has, has a, a similarity. But Can were, in a sense, more successful after Can than... Mm during can you know they had their success but today everyone looks back and 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 cites can of one of the bands that inspired them yes i mean I, I, certainly can and crowd rock have been incredibly influential on radiohead possibly more than any other genre and of course because it's such a hidden genre radiohead got a huge advantage because people don't necessarily always recognize that you have bits of can or bits of faust in their music, you know, it's not just craft work. Um, and and I, I think musically, musically is very similar to Can, but Can, you know, they never had, they never had those issues with fame. They never, they, they, they never sold millions of records. They never played stadiums. And I think there are, there are significant differences there because it, there is one level where if, you, if, if you're not as popular as Radiohead are, then it's very easy, it's very easy to maintain your, your musical dignity. It's very, very easy to go your own way because so few people care. And usually, usually because they're fanatical, as say can fans have to be, because you don't get casual can fans, I guess, <laughs> that, they, that, that means they will follow almost any musical direction that, that can choose to go in. And yes, you know, I mean, think how poppy I want more is. You know, that can's near hit. Yeah, they could do that as well. And of course, they went, they went, there was elements of jazz in there as well as crowd rock. And um, that kind of musical Catholicism is certainly something that, that Radiohead understood. And yes, you can you talk to Radiohead about Can, that they know exactly, they, they understand exactly that career path. But to be Can selling millions of records is something else entirely. That's possibly what's so incredible about it. One thing, one thing I found really interesting is maybe because I live yeah. in Germany, so people that I know that love Radiohead don't necessarily know the lyrics at all, but still they see them in the same way <laughs> that most people see them. So somehow they're, they've been able to transport um, often this angst 
that that you know that it's sort of within their within their lyrics in their music as well which is a fascinating aspect that they've been a successful just because of their music in countries where their lyrics aren't understood as they have been in countries where they are understood by their lyrics oh i think that's a really good point because they, you know a lot of tom's lyrics you can't really understand a lot of them you you don't know exactly what they mean it's just phrases thrown together it's like, it's it's often sort of fridge poetry some of it but i think that the, the tension in radio it's music yeah, this is something like say optimistic or everything in its right place then i think that tension translates internationally and because even as an english speaker you don't always know what tom is saying then it's that it's i keep going back to this it's that overall collective thing and that translates internationally you can feel the tension in radiohead's music even when they've been a bit softer say like on um, the king of limbs then it's still there and and that feeling that musical feeling is international it, it it transcends almost everything and yes so that i think is why people in in germany and other non-English speaking territories, why they get it. And, um, you know, it's why Radiohead age in South Africa uh, I, and, and South America and in, in uh, a lot of the, the Asian countries too, where people do have familiarity with English. But that's not the point, that if you, if, if you listen to a Radiohead song, it's not a singer backed by a band. It's everyone chipping in and doing different things to make it again collective how much were you before you wrote this book yourself a fan someone that had been to see radiohead maybe been seen tom york on his solo or with smile or whatever but you know someone who'd been um uh, a fan of the band and someone who's been really into their music and how did writing this book change your perception of them um, it did. It did change. It changed my perception quite a lot. I, I'd be lying if I, if I said I was a super fan before it. But what I was, what what I was intrigued by, was how five people like this have done what they've done because it simply didn't make sense to me, and uh, it, I'm not sure it makes complete sense to them either. And that I think is a fascinating thing. How did they? How did we get here? And how are we sounding like this? And that's what I was really trying to understand. I didn't expect to come up with a definitive answer. And I, 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 again, I'd be lying if I said I had one, but I understand it more. And I understand that it, that, that's that notion of, without sounding sentimental, togetherness that has brought it. But in terms of their music, then you know, I'd, always, I'd always very much enjoyed OK Computer. But I think delving deeper, it really, it, what really hit home and what surprised me is, is how much I, I, I went for those albums such as Kid A and, and Amnesiac and the, the King of Limbs, the latest stuff and how they musically developed after OK Computer. And I think on a, on a musical level, that is absolutely phenomenal. And to listen to, to that music and to get into it as deeply as I, I tried to do, it was more rewarding the deeper I went. You know, I've been sick of Creep for decades. I'm still sick of it now. But those, those later albums and OK Computer itself, let's not forget, the deeper you go into it, the better it is. They, Radiohead songs individually and albums as a whole are the gift that keeps on giving. You learn something more every time. You enjoy a little bit more. You can focus on different things each time you play them. And that, in where well, there's a lot of fly by night music, and I'm a massive fan of fly by night music, but this is something that is a bit deeper and that, uh, you, that is rewarded by being obsessed with it. And I think that's why they have so many obsessive fans, frankly, because they, they, they're getting a good deal. I must say, what you said that you got out this greater understanding of them and why they you know went in this direction and why they became who they became is what I got out of the book as well um and I really I really enjoyed it and I enjoyed your <laughs> slightly offhand 
humor that comes through as well, which was really fun and um, kept me going um, through the book. And again, I really have to thank you, John. I actually saw Tom York on a solo set just, I think it was a few days before COVID hit. I know it's just yeah. before COVID and it was the last concert before, before that period. And it was a fantastic uh, experience. It was a brilliant evening it was absolutely incredible uh, again another great book so john Isaacwood of uh the book radiohead life in a glass house thank you very much it's been a pleasure thank you very much steve up there is an interview i recommend down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews and here is where you can connect <laughs>